Uh, welcome to first course on power systems. And uh, we are going to talk about module three today. And this module is on transmission lines and cables. And uh, like our other modules, like uh, our other modules, uh, this is very tightly connected to our reference textbook as well. So in this module, uh, we'll look at uh, AC transmission lines and underground cables. And we'll start out with why we need them. And uh, we'll primarily be talking about overhead AC transmission lines, although later on we'll look at cables. And uh, we'll look at why we transpose these lines, how do, can we calculate these transmission line parameters. And obviously, these are distributed uh, parameter lines. So how, that, how can we represent them? And uh, also, uh, how can we load them? So we need to find out what their surge impedance is of these transmission lines and what the surge impedance loading is. And then also how we can model them by lumped parameter models if you're only interested in the terminal, terminals of this line. So we'll go through it all uh, uh, pretty quickly. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, why do we need transmission lines? And uh, we had introduced this picture in module one, uh, which shows that all these lines uh, interconnect uh, tens of thousands of generators and all the loads. And we have distribution lines, and we have uh, uh, transmission lines. And over 230 kV, we have over uh, 200,000 miles of transmission lines in, uh, in North America here. <laughs> so uh, we will look at uh, primarily overhead transmission lines, but we will talk a little bit about cables. And uh, the other thing which we wouldn't talk about is uh, HVDC lines. Uh, they are, you know, in some respects quite similar, but they are uh, in a special category, and we will look at them along with HVDC transmission systems. <clears throat> so uh, the, the reason why we need these transmission lines is that generally the, uh, the generation is in remote areas away from metropolitan areas and load centers. So we have to bring the power from these remote areas to uh, the load centers, and uh, these transmission lines really have become a bottleneck. There's not enough transmission uh, capacity, and that's one of the things which is holding back uh, renewable energy generation, like uh, generation using wind. Okay, so that's a very critical topic uh, for today. So. Uh, as I mentioned to you, there are distribution lines at lower voltages, but when we talk about uh, transmission line voltages, we are referring to, you know, these definitions vary, but anywhere from 115 kV to 600, 765 kV transmission lines, okay? And uh, all these lines are three-phase, so we have to keep that in mind. So here is a picture of a, a 500 kV transmission line uh, that comes from the uh, northern part of Minnesota to somewhere very close to Twin Cities here. And uh, <clears throat> so here we look at the tower, the conductors, and the bundling of these conductors uh, in, this, uh, in context of this uh, particular system here. <clears throat> so, so if you look at uh, towers, uh, you know, a typical tower structure is shown here. And you can see that uh, the height of this tower above ground is about 140 feet. And uh, the span of this is about 40, 50 feet here, uh, something like that. And, uh, you know, in this particular case, there are five towers per mile, okay, for this uh, particular uh, transmission line. So these are pretty, pretty massive structures. Uh, when it comes to conductors, uh, these conductors are ACSR, which stands for Aluminum Conductor Steel Reinforced. So the outer strands here are aluminum, and that's where the current flows. But inside, you know, this part here is where you have steel for strength, okay? So generally the current doesn't flow there, so why not put higher resistivity material, which is also very strong compared to aluminum? So that's what is done in these ACSR conductors. All right, so the other thing we, we have to keep in mind with these uh, uh, transmission uh, network is that we also use of what is called ground wires or shield wires. And these shield wires shield the 
the transmission conductors from lightning strikes. Okay, so these are commonly used as shown uh, in this picture over here, and every so many towers, uh, these uh, uh, shield wires are grounded and you would like to have as low a tower footing resistance as possible to effectively ground these uh, shield wires. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Other thing we'll look at is uh, bundling of these conductors. So first of all, uh, you know, in this 500 kV line, you see that uh, each phase is consisting of three conductors in a bundle, and these are about 18 inches apart, as you can see in a tri triangular configuration. <clears throat> and the reason for using bundling is to minimize electric strength at the conductor surface to be less than, let's say, 16 kV per centimeter, okay? And that is to avoid corona, as uh, we'll see later on. And uh, for 345 kV lines, generally you may have uh, a two-conductor bundle where these conductors uh, in each, any given phase are 18 inches apart, or as you see here in a 500 kV line, uh, you have a three conductor bundle, and uh, these are 18 inches apart, as shown here. So that's, uh, this is pretty common. Uh, what is the cost of these transmission lines? Uh, you know, these uh, costs can vary in a very wide range. Uh, I have some typical numbers here for 340 uh, 5 kV line. It's like, uh, uh, 0.5 million dollars per mile in uh, rural areas, but when you come to closer to the metro areas, then it re exceeds, uh, you know, it reaches uh, two million miles per, uh, two million dollars per mile. And uh, from what I understood, uh, in Minnesota, the average cost for lines of this type is about uh, 750 thousand dollars per mile. So these are fairly expensive uh, structures or systems. <clears throat> so the other thing is that uh, uh, you know these lines are not totally balanced. As you saw in our earlier structure here, uh, uh, if you look at this, uh, th these three conductors over here, their heights uh, with respect to ground are different. Okay, so this causes uh, unbalance. And uh, there are other types of uh, uh, geometries. For example, uh, these three wires could be connected in a, or laid in a vertical fashion, or they could be in, all three conductors would be horizontal at the same height above ground. But the point is that uh, if you look at this vertical uh, configuration as shown here, the coupling between phases A and B is not the same as coupling between A and C over here, right? Because the distance is different. So <clears throat> one way to balance out uh, uh, all three phases would be to transpose them as shown here, okay? And, but this is seldom used because uh, it's a very expensive proposition. It's very easy to draw them uh, transposed here. You just connect them as shown here. It takes a second. But uh, when you actually transpose them at such high voltages, uh, you know, they require quite a bit of expense uh, to make this happen. <clears throat> but uh, nevertheless, what is recommended is that if you have a, a triangular configuration, then a barrel length, which is, you know, one cycle as shown here, is 100 miles, or it should be less. Uh, you should, that means you should do it more frequently if you have vertical or horizontal configuration here. But for our purposes, we'll assume them to be balanced. That means all three phases have the same uh, parameters. <clears throat> so if we can assume them, assume them to be balanced, then we can analyze them on a per phase basis. Okay, so, <clears throat> so that is what's shown here. You're seeing one of the phases is per phase. And this, this uh, uh, you know, thick heavy duty conductor that's shown here, that is really sort of a neutral where there's no current flows and under balanced uh, sinusoidal steady state conditions, okay? But this is just to analyze on a per phase basis, okay? And uh, in effect, uh, all transmission lines are distributed. So you, you have R, L, and C uh, distributed 
uh, all along the, the transmission line. Okay. So we will uh, see how we can calculate uh, uh, these parameters here. So the first thing we will start with is line resistance. And we can all agree that uh, it's important to minimize losses, and therefore it's, uh, it's a good idea to have this line resistance as small as possible. But a smaller resistance would mean uh, more, uh, uh, you know, more diameter of the conductor, and that will also mean, uh, you know, the tower strength has to go up to handle those conductors. Okay, so the cost is involved as we try to minimize uh, the resistance and therefore the I squared loss in these lines here. So there, there has to be some trade-off, and it's estimated that. Uh, you know, in, in the U.S., about 9% of the power generated is lost in transmission and distribution. Okay. So with this objective of keeping resistance small, uh, first of all, we know what uh, the formula for resistance is. It's the uh, 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 resistivity times the line length divided by the cross-sectional area, right? So we know that. And, uh, but uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, we are dealing with AC current, so there is a skin effect here. So this delta is the skin depth, and uh, you can see that in a solid conductor, if you have current at 60 hertz, it'll be, the current density would be high uh, at the surface, but as you go towards the center, this current density would decrease because of skin effect. And, uh, <coughs> The, the skin depth delta, delta is where the current density has dropped by a factor of E. And E is, I think, something like 2.73 or something like that. Okay? So, uh, so it doesn't make sense to have a solid conductor at, uh, even at 60 hertz frequency. And so it, making an ACR conductor or using an ACR conductor makes a great deal of sense. And uh, so the resistivity of steel is much higher than, of, than that of aluminum. So we can consider that to be hollow here, as shown here. Okay, and uh, the aluminum is then at the outside over here. So we can calculate the, uh, the resistance of this conductor, uh, including the skin effect here. So that's what is given in tables and so forth, but they, it can also be calculated using uh, uh, other types of programs. Uh, the other thing we have to worry about is the shunt conductance, uh, which, which is a source of loss. And uh, yeah, one of the causes of this loss is corona effect. And we all have heard of this uh, hissing sound coming from transmission lines, especially under misty conditions, and that's uh, corona. And, uh, you know, we, we, of course, try to minimize this corona uh, effect. And... Uh, this uh, loss can be represented by connecting a conductance in parallel or in shunt with a transmission line capacitance. So that's how uh, we can model it. <coughs> but uh, the loss associated with this uh, uh, corona effect and leakage currents are so, uh, uh, that's so small that it's totally okay to neglect it. So that's what we will do later on in our discussion. Okay. <coughs> 